The Hash It Out Show is brought to you by Barreto Home Solutions. Bayou Audio and Video. Hot Works on the North Shore. JFK Martial Arts in Mandeville and Covington. Blackhawk Hauling. Lil Dizzy's Cafe. Wags Food and Culture. Moe's Pizza. The Green Law Firm. Personal Injury Attorney. Drums Earwear. Hands up, hands up, hands up, hands up. If you winning and you don't give up, go by the hater till the moon. Move, 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 move. Cause I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning. 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 Hands up, hands up, hands up. If you winning and you don't give up. Tell them move, 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 cause I'm winning, 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 I'm winning. Hello everyone and welcome to the Hash It Out Show. I'm your host. JB, your sports guy, we got a great show for you all tonight. We got two special guests. Before we get to our special guests, I have two co-hosts who help me each and every week. They both work with CrescentCitySports.com. First, we got the one, the only, VK Jones. What's up, VK Jones? Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, like, tag, share, subscribe to the Hash It Out Show on all, all social media platforms. And we got a good one tonight. We're going to recap some prep football, college football, and NFL as well. But this week is a huge week, week number three in the LHSAA. And it is officially rivalry week, rivalry week right here in the state of Louisiana. We got two special guests dealing with one of the longest rivalries in the state. And we're looking forward to talk about that tonight on the Hash It Out Show. Most definitely. Awesome other co hosts. George GP Peppers. What's up, GP? Well, that's VK's hyping it. As long as we don't recall Sunday night, because I'm still wiping the tire tracks off of what happened Sunday. I mean, that, that was pretty humiliating. But I'm doing great. Like VK said, we're in for a great, great show tonight. We're going to spotlight a big rivalry game. That's one of the oldest rivalries in the city. And I'm looking forward to this show tonight. It's going to be great. Our first special guest, he's been the head coach. At Chalmette High School since 2007, he is entering his 17th season as the head coach. We have Coach Jason Tucker. Coach, how you doing? And thank you for joining us tonight. Good. How y'all doing, guys? Uh, thank y'all for having us and uh, covering our game. We appreciate it. Most definitely, Coach. Thank you. Coach, I want to get started. Why did you want to become a coach? Well, um, a guy who coached me in high school named Jay Pittman who's been a coach at uh, head coach at Chairman High School, a head coach at Jesuit, and also the head coach at Brother Martin for a time. Um, I was in college at UNO, and uh, he called me and said he needed an a eighth-grade football coach with him at uh, while he was a defense coordinator at Jesuit. This was in 1995. I was a year removed from high school, and um, I've coached ever since. How has it been coaching – at your alma mater now for 17 seasons? Uh, it's definitely been an honor and a, pri a privilege for us to, um, you know, for me and my coaching staff to be here. You know, the same hallways I walked as a kid, you know, so I've been here over 20 years of my, my life total, being a student, being a player, being a coach. You know, it's great just to give back to the community where you come from. Coach, back in 2021, you became – the all-time winningest coach at Chalmette. Can you describe how that feeling was once you broke the record held by Bobby Nuss? 
Oh, it was a great honor to be mentioned the same breath of Coach Noss. You know, he's a legend at Shaman High School. You know, and uh, breaking that record was a was a community event. It was a staff event. It was my, you know, coaches who have been with here with me, the players who came through. It wasn't just about me. You know, I was just, uh, you know, part of what was going on. You know, if you ever been around Shaman High School, we have one of the best principals, administrators around, great leadership. Um, so I was just, I was just part of what was going on. I saw that you used to work under one of your assistants, Richard Walker, when he was a head coach at Archbishop Hannon, and now he is your assistant, and he's been there with you ever since. What can you tell me that you've learned from him? when you were an assistant of his and also now being the head coach where he's an assistant of yours? Well, <clears throat> I don't think your show is long enough for me to tell you everything I learned from uh, Richard Walker. <laughs> you know, he's one of the major influences on my coaching career. Um, coach Walker is now our athletic director, so he is now my boss again. Um, he's the athletic director. He replaced our long-term, our long-time AD, uh, Coach Dave Brassett, who retired. So Coach Walker is, you know, still shaping me. He's just doing it from a little bit afar instead of being on the staff. You know, um, many times throughout my career, I leaned on him, even when I wasn't on the same staff with, with Coach Walker. You know, we met, talked game plan, talked different things, and uh, he's definitely, I definitely wouldn't be where I am without him. We are live with Coach Jason Tucker, the head coach of the Shalmet Owls. Everyone who's watching, please click that subscribe button on YouTube. Coach Tucker... In 2006, you were the defensive coordinator at Jesuit High School. A year later, you took the head coaching job at Chalmette, but you said that was a tough decision to make. How was that a tough decision for you to make when Chalmette is your alma mater? Well, when you're in one of the top districts in the uh, in the state, you know, I was hired there by Sid Edwards, who was there a year at, at Jesuit. And then coming in the spring of that year, of um, the spring of 06, uh, spring of 07, Coach uh, Wade Kaiser came in and took over the head coaching job. He interviewed me. He rehired me as a defensive coordinator, so it showed confidence in what I was doing. And then the Shamet job didn't open up to late June or early July. So Coach Kaiser was great to me. You know, he could have held it about, uh, you know, over my head about you took the job so late. Whatever. And, uh, you know, he told me a chance to be a head coach. You know, you need to really consider it. So Coach Kaiser really – help me um, make that decision. When you took over the program, you had around 40 players. Now you're well over 100. How were you and your assistants able to make this happen? Just uh, being consistent in our program and, you know, just trying to put together some wins. I think nothing builds a program like winning. You know, and, just, and just holding our kids accountable. We talk every day about being accountable, communicating to us, being good citizens, being good in the school, you know, keeping good kids on our team. And, um, you know, we'll sacrifice, you know, a, a kid who doesn't do things right, you know, over a good kid that does. It's just how our program is. And that's how, you know, Mr. Wayne Warren and all wants our school to be represented. And that's what I believe in, too. Before I pass it on to VK Jones, this upcoming Friday, you guys are taking on the Holy Cross Tigers. It's a long time rivalry, but I want you to explain the origin of this rivalry, how it got started to where it is now. Well, the rivalry got started as far as I know, you know, back in the sixties, it's the longest public school, private school rivalry in the state. You know, um, as we all know, Holy Cross was really close to St. Bernard Parish. And at the time before Katrina, St. Bernard Parish had a lot of Catholic elementary schools. A lot of, you know, they had Oscar's of Hannon here, one high school. But a lot of the Catholic elementary schools were able to feed their kids the Holy Cross. So these are kids that we grew up with. You know, now there's only one, OLPS, is the only Catholic elementary school. So it's not as great as it was back then, the Robin, just because of the, the disconnect of that and the closeness of Holy Cross being right over the St. Claude Bridge. And, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, elementary Catholic kids went to the, went to Holy Cross. Jason Tucker, uh, it's good to see you. Good to, good to hear from you uh, this evening, man. I, I, I took your, 
I took your health advice and everything, man, and I lost about 65 pounds. I'm at 280 now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I appreciate your advice, my man. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, it's good to have you on the show. Oh, thank you very much. You look good. You look good. Keep it going. Thank you. I will do that. I got to I gotta ask you, man, you got a good bit of experience back this season. I uh, know last season we talked when we uh, when I broadcast that game last season at Tag Gormley that team was pretty young. They hung in there for a half and then Holy Cross made the adjustments. Uh, this season you have a lot back this year, including your quarterback, Ethan Kuvion, who uh, came up big last week against Lakeshore. Tell us about his leadership and also how Jaden Alfonso and Stone Revere has been pretty much your stalwarts on on your team this season. Well, um, Ethan Kuvion is a um, different kind of case. You don't see much in football. Two years ago, he was one of our starting offensive linemen. Then we had a need for quarterback, and we were talking about uh, Richard Walker earlier. Richard Walker had him in uh, PE class and, you know, started developing as a quarterback. Then Coach Craig DeHarty, who's his quarterback coach now, continued that. So Ethan started off as an offensive lineman. He's an offensive lineman's dream. Um, he moved on. So in the last two weeks, he had about 500 yards in offense, which, you know, since I've been here 17 years, the most definitely back-to-back yards anyone had. You know, so he's definitely a leader for us. He's uh, trimmed up a little bit, has himself in, in really good shape. He can throw the ball. He knows the offense well. He's a three-year starter. Like I said, one-year offense line, second-year uh, quarterback. So he does a great job leading our offense. Well, it's well. It looks like it is is the court that that's amazing there, and it's almost similar to what you've been doing health wise too. That 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 really kind of warms your heart, huh, Coach? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Then you mentioned um, Stone Revere. You know, Stone's another another kid for us who I'm very proud of personally. You know, he's taken a different different path in some. You know, he played up backup quarterback. He played a little fullback, little H back, just trying to find way onto the field he just kept fighting kept working to get himself to be a starter and he's our you know middle linebacker in our defense and one of our leaders on defense and i'm very proud of him because the the path he took it wasn't an easy path and he kept fighting kept believing himself kept working hard and uh, i'm very happy for him absolutely and 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 take and and, um you know you got a good kicking game as well very consistent with alfonso and everything and coming and coming into this game coming up on Friday, it looks like this, the kicking game is going to be really a key more than anything else. And I know both teams is going to be really going to try their best to try to have the best special teams to try to win that ball game on Friday. Yeah, I think anytime you have uh, you know two go programs like we have, you know Coach Watney, I'm doing a great job coaching. You know we, we put a lot of emphasis ourselves on special teams, so we're both going to be sound. It's going to be you know it's going to be who can execute just like any other part of the game. It's a third of the game. We preach it to our kids all the time. You know, we don't take breaks on special teams. If you're tied, we'll rest on offense and defense. You know, having Jaden Afonso aboard, having a kid that can kick the ball, can punt the ball, is athletic. You know, last week he ran out the back end zone to, uh, for the safety. You know, from about the 25, we, we wanted to give up a safety at the end of the game against Lakeshore. And, you know, we had confidence in him being able to take the snap, get into the end zone, and, and do what we asked him to do. Coach, you have really um, been consistent with this program over the years, and you did not just take them to win multiple district championships, but you took them a couple trips deep in the playoffs and as much to the state quarterfinals one time. So, you know, it seemed like you continued to try to push and push this Chalmet program to another level. Well, we, we're going to um, continue continue to work hard and just uh... – Never be happy with the end of the result of our season unless we win the championship. We're just going to continue to work. A little nostalgia, a little bit, uh, Coach. I know you was that. I know Sean your alma mater and everything else. You know how it's been that this community has embraced um, one school since Hurricane Katrina. We remember back then it was Archbishop Hannon. Um, we had Andrew Jackson, St. Bernard, and everything in one area, and all of a sudden Hurricane Katrina changed everything and then all of a sudden you played archbishop hannon for the first time probably since then since katrina over in chalmette what was your thoughts and also how did the community embrace that one school in one community well we've been playing um we've been playing hannon for a few years you know back and forth a little bit even when coach watney was the head coach at um at hannon 
so Coach uh, Wadi came here, and uh, you know when he was the head coach at Hannon, we went there and we came back, and then um, last year we played Hannon at Hannon, and this year we, we finished it up and played here. You know, having uh, you know one high school, you know having one high school, you know we're not we're not a private school, so we can't go out and recruit anyone or get anyone from out of our district, or out of our parish to come to our school. So that you know we have to play with, with what's given to us. So we're blessed with having one high school and having you know all the kids in St. North Parish coming to this school. Absolutely, absolutely, and um, and and I and I know how she I met embraces the community and everything else, and also one of your uh coaches on the staff, Dominic Corral, who's uh who's done a great job on your staff, but also is an assistant coach for the Nunez baseball team, the Nunez Community College baseball team, who's been re really making strides in the in Saint Bernard Parish, and it seems like. It's a. It seems like it's a family atmosphere all around. How 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 Chalmet embraces Nunez more than anything else. Your thoughts, especially for Coach Corral, and how much how hard he's working at Chalmet. Well, actually, uh, yes, uh, Coach Dominic Foss is a does a great job with us. He shows up every day, works hard. You know, he helps Coach Glenn Powell, who's the you know the the coach who started the program over there at Nunez. He's one of his assistant coaches. You know, Dominic played here for us. He was a. a a three-year uh, multi-sport guy he played. He did uh, baseball, track. He's a quarterback on the football team. He went to state for the javelin. Played on a, you know winning baseball teams here. So Dom was a, a well-rounded guy. He could have went could have went to college for track or baseball. He went for baseball. Uh, he went for baseball, and now he's back helping Coach Glenn Powell in baseball and helping us on the football team. You know, um, having Dominic and uh, we have an, an, another young man we hired this year with us, uh, Malik Blaze. Malik Blaze is a, a guy who also played for us over here, played college baseball, played at, played at Southern. Um, to have these guys who played for us to come back to our program really gives me a sense of pride because they believe in what we do. If not, they wouldn't be back here. And they have a direct relationship to the kids to let them know that, hey, I was I was, I was like you a few years ago. It ain't been that long. So I think it really helps having some youth and, and guys who've been through what they've been through at Shaman High School in our, in our, our program. Got to ask you just one more thing, and I'll pass it on to George Peppers for some questions. Um, Bobby Nuss Stadium, it's been unbelievable long time ago, but how it's grown over the years to be one of the most premier footballs in the state of Louisiana. Can you uh, tell us your thoughts on the atmosphere and not just that, how everything worked out to whether the stadium becoming one of the best in the state? Well, I think our facilities at Chairman High School, we can go against anyone in the state, in the nation. I mean, we have three gyms on campus. We have um, artificial turf, softball field, baseball field, football field. We have an indoor track. We have an outdoor track. We have an uh, Olympic-sized swimming pool for our swimming team. We have uh, wrestling arenas. We uh, arena. We have um, <coughs> we have a state of weight room. You know, we, we have everything that we have some college that come in and say, coach, I have better facilities than us. Like I will put our facilities against anyone. You know, we, we're blessed to have all the things that we do have that we do have here. You know, we have two theaters here. Uh, performing arts people are great. I'll be, we have 110 people in the band. So it's a it's a big time place. It's a five A. It's a five A place that's treated like a five A program from the top to bottom, not just not just football, not just athletics but from academics to extracurriculars to to everything i think our kids are very blessed to have everything we have here george peppers coach Tucker, first off thank you for giving us the time out of this busy week for joining us on the show tonight um my first question is going to go on your first, first two games you guys handled hannon pretty same and you, you squeak one out against lakeshore last week 24 22. How do you feel about your team? I know they're two and zero, but where do you feel like your team needs to improve a little bit? You know, coaches are are, are, are funny about that; they're always looking for the littlest things. Where, where do you see most improvement from your team? Well, I think with the um, the restrictions, I don't know if y'all wear the wet ball with the heat and everything. It's been yes. uh, it's been off and on on the field, off the field, different things. So I think conditioning is an issue with that. Even though you're doing inside, do things not the same. You know, um, dealing dealing with that, not being on the field, some of the transition stuff you get off the sideline, especially with special teams. Some of that is a challenge, but I thought we think we've been handling it well. We've been putting a lot of emphasis on it. But when you're not on the field for so many days, you know, every coach in this state is battling this. 
Mm-hmm. You know, every coach stays battling the wet bulbs of not being on the field. And I, I just don't get it that you can play in it, but you can't practice in it. And we're preparing our guys, our young men, for collisions that we're missing out on. So just to get in those uh, – as we get into, you know, a little bit cooler weather – where we get on the field, just getting those collisions, but you're already in the season. So just trying to get better at, at those things. And I noticed in your schedule, you don't, you guys don't leave home until week five. Uh, you got this week, Holy Cross, next week, Patterson, and then you finally hit the road. Was that schedule placed by design? Well, uh, the fact that you're playing your first four games at home? Well, we paid our penance last year where we took them all on the road first. So that's it, true. It was, it was not about that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But it wasn't on purpose. It's just, you know, when you're trying to schedule games, you got to give and take with other teams what they're trying to do. So it wasn't it wasn't mm. on it wasn't on purpose that we have all these games. I'm sure my administrative support guys would like to have a week off, whether they're not having every game on Friday back to back, because it's a lot to host a game. Like Bobby Nuss has been full, the stadium's been full, and we expect it to be full this week on both sides. So it's a lot to run these to run these games. You know, a lot of that falls on Coach Walker, the AD. You know, so yeah, having having mm-hmm. all these games is a challenge, but no, it wasn't. It wasn't planned that way. It just fell that way to be able to get Patterson on the schedule and Bugger Loose on the schedule and getting those guys, Lakeshore, hand to get those guys on the schedule, you know, trying to play teams that are going to win some games and be a, a better opponents to help us be better placed in the playoffs. And then looking ahead to district play, I know you still got a few games to go in non-district, but 8-5-A, I mean, you expect John Aaron to rebound after the slow start. West Jeff struggles uh, and other teams. Like, what do you guys – feel like y'all can be when a five gets ready to go uh you broke up you said that again please oh it's i'm sorry uh, i was gonna ask you and i hate to look ahead well it's just natural i guess but a five a district play in a couple of weeks how do you assess your team uh, i know there's a few more games to go uh before we hit district but how do you feel like it's what do you feel like your team's at and uh, as compared to uh everyone else like Aaron, west jeff and east jeff no, no, we're definitely not looking at fall ahead. You know, I really haven't uh, seen a lot, but the scores on those guys, you know, but I, I would think overall mm-hmm. that our district is better because of the closing of some of the schools in Jefferson Parish. I would think you know, closing, sure. you know, Grace King, some of those kids went to East Jeff's, East Jeff, some of them went to Bonneville, and then closing Helen Cox on the, on the West Bank, some of them kids went to West Jeff and some went to uh, Eric, went to John Eric. Right. So if you give you know if you gave mm-hmm. me three or four more starters that can that can filter in from anywhere, it's obviously going to make you better. So I think the district itself is going to be be more competitive and and better. So I'm not sure where it's all going to fall out because we're not really looking at fall. You know, and a lot of our district right. guys they'll play they play some hard games early to prepare themselves for later, sure. and then you'll see some of that early on. Holy Cross has scored 94 points in two games. They've just dropped 49 on a pretty good De La Salle defense that, to be fair, missed six starters Saturday night, and Holy Cross still dropped 49 on them. What have you seen on film from the Tigers that you're gonna, that's going to be a challenge to you guys Friday? And talk about Cole Kenafella, their quarterback. Oh, yeah, so you broke up again. Who you said was missing six starters? I didn't hear you. Holy Cross, when they beat De La Salle Saturday, De La Salle was missing six starters yeah. in that game. They had six defensive starters did not play. And Holy Cross still put 49 on them. Uh, I know you've gotten film on Holy Cross. Uh, talk about their offense. They've scored 94 points in the first two weeks. Um, and especially Cole Canatella, their quarterback. Yeah, I, I was able to see him now. Jamboree uh, live versus Bell Chase. They played the game before us. Um, I mean, that skill guy, them, the skill guys of Holy Cross have a really good players. That's why they have college mm-hmm. offers. That's why uh, they put up the numbers they like. The quarterback. You know, when he has a good clean pocket, he can he can put the ball on on a dime where it needs to be. You know, they have some guys I really like that. They're running backs. I think they're well balanced on their on their skill guys on the offensive side of the ball. No doubt. Uh last question before I turn it over to Jared. Uh you already said Bobby Nuts will probably be sold out. So I'm guessing there's not a ticket to be had Friday night from the Shalmet side of things. Well, we're going to keep selling tickets. You know, we're not going to uh, stop selling tickets. We got to make a little money. But no, um, seriously, oh, there's still there's still tickets available. But it's going to be it's going to be packed. I mean, it's always a good game. It's going to be packed. You know, we're we're both uh, we're both two and zero. We're both two and zero going into this, and um, you know, so I think that the um, the interest has piqued a lot of people's interest to come see this game. So I, th- I expect this to be standing room only. Everyone that's joining us. We want to thank you all for joining us. 
please, if you're watching on YouTube, please click the subscribe button. Coach Tucker, as you know, last year the LHSAA decided to make their own change to the playoff format system, um, putting Jefferson Parish on these Parish into select automatically, some Lafayette schools into select, even some Alexandria schools. Um, nine schools sued the LHSAA and the judge um, ruled in their favor. And as of right now, supposedly the playoff format is back to what it was in 2021. What are your thoughts about this injunction? Well, I just think, you know, we need to, they need to come together and get the principles. As far as I know, that's the organizations led by, by the principals and get together and get a vote and see what the principals want to do. That's a little bit above my pay grade. We're going to play wherever they, wherever they put us. I was surprised personally that those schools in Jefferson Parish were put into the, the select, you know, select bracket, seeing that they're all public schools and there is this, but I, I might not know, know it all, you know, might not know all sides of it, but I was surprised by that. VK, you got another question? No, nah, I think, I, I think uh, coach hit it on the mark. I think, I think me and uh, Coach Tucker's on the same page with that. And I think that was something I said when that came out, Coach Tucker, that the that, that LHSA needs to meet with the administrations to get this thing straight and come up with a plan. And that's what they need to do, like, immediately. And right now it has, has not really happened, but it needs to come up soon. And they don't need to have it done late, you know. So I'm on the same page with Coach Tucker. Well, I saying. think it – um. I think sometimes you look at like Salmon, for example, and I think Bell Chase had a wind up playing up in 5A and they are 4A and they already had their mm-hmm. schedules made. Mm-hmm. So if you're trying to do all that stuff right. to come on the back end of it, I, I wish they would at least settle for two years the same length as our contracts are. You know, so we like this, you know, you have game contracts, they use their two years. So if they had it set for two years and moved on, but change it once people are already scheduled, I don't see how that's fair to anyone. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Coach Tucker, we want to thank you for joining us. We truly appreciate it. Good luck to you and your team this Friday night and throughout the rest of the season. Thank you, Coach Tucker. All right. Thank you all. Hey, I'm a big supporter of uh, Just for Kicks, by the way. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> definitely, sir. All right. You take care. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. He's a big supporter of Just for Kicks martial arts in Mandeville in Covington. Shout out to Master Andrew Boje and his wife, Mrs. Debbie Boje. Um, guys, Sean Bat and Holy Cross, big time robbery. We are waiting for Scott Watney, the head coach of Holy Cross, to join us. But VK, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts on this Sean Met Owls team for this year? It's a veteran Sean Met Owls team that returned multiple starters this year. And they're looking to do bigger and better things. They're looking to try to make a, a good run back deep in the playoffs like they did about uh, three years ago and everything. So they're trying to turn things up this year. And they're off to a nice start, you know what I'm saying? Especially, you know, a good win against Hannon, but not just that, a real big win against Layshaw in a very close game that they squeaked out. So that shows a lot that this Shalman team – can be very very good and they probably can beat almost anybody but they're gonna have to turn their play up a little bit more this week against a very good holy cross team that is showing that they might be in the race for the cat league title we don't know but at the same time holy cross is off to a really good start coach widen's got something over there but i think coach jason tucker has done an unbelievable job over at shaman and he's continued to stay consistent it's amazing that he's been at that job that long and he loves his community and he embraces it very well. George Peppers, what do you think? I mean, this is going to be a highly entertaining game. This is one I wish we would have, but you know, we picked the game that we're going to front and in advance. So, um, Turlings and St. Charles's will, will be Friday night, but this game, I'm like VK. I think Chalmette's got a really nice squad. They've gotten off to a good start. An expected blowout over Hannon, and then they squeaked out a win against a tough, gritty Lakeshore team, 24-22. Uh, that's, a, that's a gut check win for them. Lakeshore is always solid, and the Owls were able to get that response win. Um, I think the challenge is great Friday night. I'm interested to see what they do to try to slow the Holy Cross offense down, because as Coach Tucker mentioned, as we've known, Holy Cross can hurt you in a lot of ways offensively. They could throw it. 
They can run it, but they're receiving, especially on the outside with their receivers. Those guys can get open on the perimeter, and that, that could be problematic for Chalmette. I think the Owls have a fine defense, but this is going to be a very great challenge for them. And as far as what VK was talking about getting into district, look, Eric's still the favorite. I mean, results notwithstanding, I still feel like John Eric is the favorite. They've the influx of kids that are there. I think that's going to benefit in district. But Shao Met's going to have a lot to say about it. It looks like it's a two team, two horse race in 8-5-A. But I know we're going to pick this game tomorrow night. I, I still, right now, I couldn't tell you who I'm picking. I really cannot. I think this is an airtight football game. It's going to be one of the better games in the area, maybe in the state. I'll say this. I, I, I really would like to see how will Shalmet stop Cole Canatella, the quarterback, Kobe Young, and Cross Johnson, the two wide receivers. That is a tough task in itself. For anybody. Yes, because those are two of yep. the best wide receivers, not just in the New Orleans area. We're talking in the state. So this is going to be a tough task. And if they can, I'm not going to say they're going to stop them. But if you can contain them, then your chances of winning are very, very high. And I think that's the number one task for these Shaman Owls in this game this Friday night is to contain Kobe Young and Cross Johnson. So you're probably going to see a lot of cover two man, might say a little cover two zone, just to stop those two guys. It's, it's, it's very important because – those two there, man, they are something else. But I'm going to say this. For the past two years, the Shalman Owls have went on the road in the playoffs. They went to West Monroe two straight years. The Shalman Owls are tired of going on the road for the first round of the playoffs. I promise you, Shalman wants to be home in the first round of the playoffs. They want to host. I Actually, they hosted. Uh, actually, they hosted um West Monroe a couple of years ago, but lost came. Well, you know, they was close early, but West Monroe pulled away in the second half. Were you there? Were you so, there? So I, I remember. I remember that a couple of years ago that they played them in the second round because it was the fact that Shawmet won in the first round, and West Monroe had to come down to Shawmet, and then I, and then got- Shawmet. It was close early, but Shawmet put it. But uh. Sister-in-law. Coach Tucker's sister-in-law. I got my facts from her. <laughs> well, well, let me check the LHS. Hey, nah. You know sure. West Monroe is known to offer schools money to come to that school. Now, I'm not saying because I, I know he wouldn't have. But I'm no, telling you, no, no, he told me when two playoff, years in a row, that's what West Monroe. When, when it was put, now, two years ago, yes, but it was one year they Posted one another. I'm going to look that up right now because when you're in the playoffs, it don't matter about money. If you roll team, you got to go. No, I'm, so, I'm, what I'm saying uh-huh. is West Monroe has been known to yeah. offer schools money if West Monroe has to go on the road. That's what I'm saying. Oh, of course. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Oh, they, have, they, have, they are known to do that. Now, I'm not saying Coach Tucker took it. No, that didn't happen. But Oh no! Like, see, most most people ain't gonna take that. No, because they know they they not. I, I know yeah. what you're saying, but I'm saying they. I think a lot of teams and high school and schools and no offense, they're not stupid. They're like, we're not giving up. We're not giving, we're up, not home giving up our home field. Yes. No way. Actually, they played each other. Hold on a second. Let me let me make sure I get this right. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let's see yep. Yep, this was let's see while VK's looking Jared um Go ahead, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, Robert Gloria's comment is 100 percent on point if yes. you see that word but I mean that is gonna be an asset test for those guys and look I talked to my friend whose son plays for Dallas L Kedrick Richardson and he works with me and uh he told me he said man look those dudes Look, Dallas. He felt like if Dallas Al had their full complement, Holy Cross obviously wouldn't have got forty nine. But you know, and there you go. There, there's your answer, Jared. J- there it is, Jared JB. Twenty twenty one. They played in Shelmet in the second round and won forty nine seven. Cool, cool. Damn. Maybe I misunderstood what she said. Oh, I'm just wrong. 
Maybe she made two years in a row. They had to play West Monroe. Two years in a row. Right they had to play West Monroe. Yeah. <laughs> Three. Because Robert Glory, right? He says that we went to West Monroe in 20 and 22. And they came to us in 21. All right, cool. There we go. There we have it. Who did they make, man, to play them three years in a row? I hope they don't play them I mean, four years in a row. That'd be just crazy. Well, you ain't lying. That's, that's a conspiracy theory if that happens. Four years it in a row? Be. <laughs> I mean, but it's all but it you, you say that and it's all on Chalmette when they get to A5A. If they win it, that's probably that matchup doesn't happen in the first round. So right, um, they win the district, correct. Right. Yeah, if they win it, if they lose it, they could fall into that that's but even if they lose it, I still, like Coach Tucker said, 8-5-A has improved. You know, they're a little bit better. Um, so I don't know how the PowerPoints, you know, I don't pay attention to the PowerPoints until the, half, the second half of the season. That's when I start diving into the numbers. It's too early in the season. A lot can happen. So I'm not going to get all hooped up on the PowerPoints. But as far as the game, this game itself, uh, Friday night, um, I don't know if is it Crescent City Sports is doing this game. VK, do you know offhand? I uh, don't know. That's a good question. It might be. Uh, I, I don't they're even not, know myself. They're not doing Carl and Warren Easton. That's no, your, your view is doing I, that. Yeah, they might be. They might be doing that game. I, I wouldn't be surprised on that part. Mm -hmm. Let me let me let me try to check and see. You check right quick, and I want to go to another topic right quick before. We get Coach Widney on here. Um, All right. So if you haven't heard, there's a quarterback named Peyton Houston from Shreveport, Louisiana. He has been enrolled at Calvary Baptist since last year as an eighth grader. Well, after their game on Thursday night, Peyton Houston withdrew from Calvary Baptist. Now, he was not the starter. There's a, another starter by the name of Abram. I want to say Abram Waddell or Abram Williams, but his first name is Abram. Mm -hmm. Abram is the incumbent starter, and he's a junior. Peyton Houston, ladies and gentlemen, is the number one ranked quarterback for the class of 2027 in the entire nation. The entire nation. Mm -hmm. He's ranked number one. When me and George had Jimmy Watson from... Um, from the um Three, Monroe, the three four times, three four times, yeah, From the three four times. Mm -hmm. I said on this show, I don't know if Peyton Houston is going to wait to start. Not when you're ranked the number one quarterback in the entire nation, but he only would have to, would have to um, wait until his junior year. Wait two years, and now you're the starter. No patience, up and gone. Mm -hmm. So. I think you could look at it two ways. Number one, yeah, he wasn't, he and his parents were not patient enough for him to start. And maybe the parents thought he was the better quarterback that should have started and they didn't like what was going on. Mm -hmm. Or number two, they want their son to start playing now somewhere. You look at it both ways. I'm just like shocked. Not shocked because I said I don't see him waiting. But I, I don't think his rankings would have dropped waiting two years for his opportunity at Calvary nope. Baptist. I don't think it would happen at all. So, you know, it's a choice as parents that they have to make and make a decision that's best for their kids. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of, I am kind of on the fence because I'm like, okay, you want your son to play now. He's ranked number one in the nation. Cool. But then like, you're going to play in two years and you're going to be the man. I'm just, you know, on the fence kind of on that one. What do you what do you say about that, GP? I told you both this when we were taking the ride to Terrebonne last Friday. And I said this, and I'll say it on air tonight. Where did I tell you he was going to go? I you think Evangel. Yes, sir. I think Danny Duran is going to do everything he can to swoop in and get this man. Now, I don't have Evangel's quarterback situation on point. I know they won last week. They beat... The, beat Mansfield like 52 to nothing or something like that. Some crazy score. Yeah. Um, but you get a guy like Peyton Houston walking on your campus, learning the playbook here a week or two, whatever, however long it takes, plug him in, and boom, you got a state championship contender, another state championship contender from Shreveport and Peyton Houston. With him, if he goes, if I'm right, if I'm right, 
because it makes the most sense. I don't know if, you know, and look, there's other things I would say, but I'm, I'm not going to use that on air because it's hyperbole, you know, hearsay. So I'm not going to engage in that. That's something we don't do on the Hash It Out show. We give our opinions and, and whatnot, but it wouldn't surprise. Just I just made a, a off the cuff prediction that I feel like it makes the most sense. Why uproot and move all the way from Shreveport to let's say New Orleans? And you know, wishful thinking, he goes to Shaw or Aaron or something like that. That's not going to happen. Realistically, I think he goes right across the way to, to Evangel Christian, and boom, Evangel uh, has themselves a, a contender for state championship honors. Uh, VK. I mean, y'all thought y'all both looked at me like, man, you know what? That actually makes sense. So, I mean, just to expound on it, uh, Bashan. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it makes sense. I make a lot of sense, you know what I'm saying? Because the thing is, could he still keep that ranking right now? He has to keep it. But at the same time, it could change because it's not on the field. They got somebody that can come up in there and take it. Because mm -hmm. the fact that is, somebody can get up in there, if somebody can get up in there that is in his classification and coming out there and proving himself, you know what I'm saying? You know, he could still have that number one, but they got going to have somebody that's a rising sophomore or junior that's going to try to come for that spot. You know, I think Houston wants to try to keep it, but not just that. I think for his parents, they're trying to get him as much exposure, exposure as possible. As in, if not too many people look at him like he's, he's a sophomore, but he waits two years, and now he's a senior starting and doesn't have any offers. Oh, he has multiple Power 5 offers already. Dude, he's already loaded on that. He's he's yes, straight on offers. He multiple power five offers. Yeah, he's good on that. Yeah, you have nothing to worry about, Peyton Houston. Those D one offers are there for you. They know they're not they're not silly. I mean, that the college is not stupid. They know. I think that, this young that's, man. That's amazing. That's that's amazing. That he's got all these offers, and he hasn't really hit the field in playing. We know how good he is, but at the same time, going step into competition like that and everything that's that's crazy. But that mm -hmm. is unbelievable, but you know, but for him to have that, you know, I think he wants to try to get on the field, get as much exposure as possible to be ready for the next level. He needs to bank that ranking up if he gets on the when he gets on the exactly. field. It's not exactly. a matter of if it, he needs to back that ranking up. It's not if because we know wherever he goes, whether it be if I'm right, Evangel or who knows, Rustin. Uh, it's not gonna be. It's somebody up north that's gonna get him. Maybe it's North DeSoto. Then it's done. But they already got a young quarterback. They don't need him. Uh, well, I say they don't need him. All right, I'm just looking at the comments here. Ooh, man, that's an interesting. From John Curtis and Sean Mitt, being having won a state championship, I feel we have more raw talent on the Sean Mitt team than when I was at John Curtis. That's a bold okay. statement. Okay. That's okay. a very bold statement to make. Okay. Indeed, indeed. I love it. I love it. Look, I love it too. I love confidence. That's yeah. You know, there's confidence and cockiness. And over the last few weeks in college football, we've heard a lot of that nonsense about cocky and all this, you know, well, of course, with Dion, but that's another topic for another time. Um, but back to Peyton Houston, uh, I don't have his measurables in front of me, Jared. You? I don't, but I know some of his Power Five offers are um, Texas Tech, Mississippi State, Ole Miss. And like the Robert Glory says, it's all about the camps now. And yep. um, Kenny Ramonde, I've talked about these Fogum twins at Evangel High School, the quarterback and the brother. They're twins. And with what you're saying is right. It, it makes sense of, that, of what you're saying, that more than likely that's where he probably will end up due to leaving Calvary Baptist. And um, I saw the, 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 the stream of Neville versus – um, Evangel, Evangel, and mm -hmm. that's those two, those twins, those brothers. They are a deadly combination. Let me tell you that. Um, so yeah, it's more than likely you are right, Kenny Ramonde. But guys, we're gonna go ahead and get to our second interview. So our next guest, he he was a player at Holy Cross. He went. Coach at Archbishop Hannon and Catholic of New Iberia. Now he's back home at his alma mater. We have the head coach of the Holy Cross Tigers, Coach Scott Watney. Coach, thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. 
And thank you for joining us, Coach. Coach, I want to start off with this. What was it or why did you want to become a football coach? <laughs> um, honestly, I didn't want to become a football <laughs> coach. When I was playing in college and I saw what a GA life looked like and I saw what those guys were doing, um, it was not flattering to say the least. Um, but I was very fortunate, man. I, 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 I fell into this profession uh, due to my time spent at UNO when UNO was back in 2010 and 11 trying to remove Division One status to go D3 and join uh, football in with their athletic department. Got in on the club football side and obviously that didn't materialize at the time. And I got offered a job from Brother Martin. And, you know, even though it may maybe not was in my original plan, uh, but it's definitely my plan. And it's going to be my future. Obviously, I, I love what I do. Um, it's great fulfillment for me. And it's definitely God's calling. What has the feeling? Well, what was the feeling like when Holy Cross told you that they're offering you the head coaching job? Um, I cried. Uh, it, it was it's. You know, this this school means a lot to me personally, um, not only because I spent eight years of my life there, but I'm one of 10 family members that went to school there. Um, so from 1949 to 2005. And, you know, it was even more of a surreal moment because I got two little boys, a five and a three year old, um, and they're on campus now. So one's in pre-K and then one's in kindergarten, um, you know, and then it, this not only has this been a dream job for me, my, my father, who passed away in 2019, um, this was a dream job for him, for me to have. And so, you know, all those emotions kind of stirred up in me when I got offered the job. And then it was even more special because my father uh, in the springtime hit his 50th anniversary. And they had, before I even was offered the job, they had asked me to stand in as a proxy to receive his golden diploma. That's one of the neat things we do at Holy Cross. You make 50 years, um, you get this, you know, you get your, you get a diploma, but this time you get a golden diploma. Um, so there was just so many factors kind of coming into, you know, not only as an alum, um, not only as a guy who played, obviously, football there, but then to have my two boys on campus and then be able to honor my dad in his 50th, uh, you know, 50th year uh, and the Golden Diploma just kind of all came together. And then the, the call of, hey, we're offering you the job is kind of it seemed like it was the only emotion that I could muster up, which is some uh, tears of joy, obviously. How has the community embraced you and your family since you've been back at Holy Cross? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's home. Um, it, it feels, even though it might not be on the same campus, um, it's it's gold and blue, it's we are HC, it's Tigers. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable, even though, you know, you step away from the institution, you know, for years and then you come back and you feel right you feel like you're right back in high school in a lot of, in a lot of ways, you know, obviously some of the same teachers that taught me in high school are still there. Uh, but just the overall community has been, you know, warm, welcoming, um, you know, kind of rally around. And I think that's, I think that's kind of natural when you, when you hire an alum. Um, and, and in this case, you know, I spent a lot, a lot of time there for eight years. I was a student there. So it's just been an awesome feeling uh, from parents to uh players, students, faculty members, uh, um, you know, and then even obviously alums too. So it's just been an, an overall just warm, welcoming feeling. We are live with the head coach of the Holy Cross Tigers football team, Coach Scott Watney. Everyone that are joining us tonight, we thank you for joining us, and please click the subscribe button. Coach Watney, this team returns a lot of talent. And yep. last season lost a well, – a few games, several games by by a close score, I should say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest challenge that you saw that you have, you and your staff, sure. have to fix? Well, I think, I think you said it best a second ago when you said staff. First, we had to assemble a staff that rivaled the co competition of staff that we, that we play, you know, against in, in our league. I mean, it's no secret the Catholic League is one of the toughest, if not toughest, uh, leagues, not only in the state, but it's obviously a nationally recognized league. Um, so it's hard to be successful when on your sideline, you're, you have seven to eight coaches and you look across the other sideline and you see 13, 15, 16 guys. Um, so what we did was we went out and we got an excellent staff. We got 13 guys on our staff. I think that's the largest staff that Holy Cross has ever had. 
we've got three former head coaches uh, or two former head coaches and obviously myself. So three guys that have sat in the hot seat before and know what that's like. Um, and I mean, we, we just we, we brought a tremendous amount of talent at the at the coaching level, which obviously I think pays dividends to our players. Right. When, when your players know that the guys that are working with them were professionals and, and not only did what they did, but achieved great success in that and then went on to go achieve a great success at the next level and some even at the next level. Um, it makes buy in a little bit easier. Um, so we, we went and addressed the staff. That was the first thing that I, I wanted to do uh, when when being hired. And the next thing was is a process that's in continuation. We have we have not arrived yet, even though we're two and zero, and you know, in a lot of ways, we should feel good about ourselves. Um, but we're just two and zero. We play we play ten weeks, and then we play in a playoff. So two and zero can easily turn into two and eight real fast. You know, I mean, uh, uh, we're not naive to think that. But from a cultural standpoint, it was to to get our guys to understand that in order for us to be successful, we have to champion every rep. We have to champion every day that we step foot on some type of environment in football. And I think when you talk about close games, we've always been competitors. We've never been winners, um, at least of recent. And so that attitude of winning has to come with how you prepare. Um, and when you prepare in a rigorous way, um, you know, people like to say, you know, will you rise to the occasion? I adamantly disagree with that. You're going to fall to the level of your training. You know, so if your training is up here, well, that's where you're going to be at when adversity hits. You know, so our goal is to raise that level of training so that when we get hit in the mouth and, and, and we, we deal with adversity, um, we're not trying to look for a hope of rising to something. We've already been there before because we've already put our kids through it. Um, so I think the biggest thing is, you know, is, you know, coupled with the coaching staff along with it's just a mindset. It's changing the mindset of guys from getting on a bus and feeling, oh, man, I, we almost had it to. No, we did it, you know, and so, um, again, it's an ongoing process. It's not something that's done. It's not something that's that that's completed, even with the teams that are, you know, consistently being in state championship um, conversations, you know, car. I mean, they have to constantly worry about, you know, getting a mindset of staying a champion and being a champion. So it's not it's not just exclusive to Holy Cross. It's anybody who's trying to be a champion. And I'm not a very smart guy, but I am smart enough to follow people who are really successful and especially in this business, you know, but Bill Walsh says, you know, professionals are professionals before they were professionals. Champions were champions before they were ever champions. And so that's kind of our, our message to our guys is on a daily basis. Are you champion that, are you champion that day? Are you champion that moment? And you could break it down to its smallest fractions if you wanted to. Before I pass it to VK Jones, this Friday night, your Holy Cross Tigers take on the Shalmet Owls. Yeah. Tell us about the origin of this rivalry, how it started, when it started. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure on when the rivalry started. I mean, I want to say Shalmet opened in the 1970s, so it probably wasn't long after that that the, the rivalry kicked off. And it's a great rivalry. It's obviously been played for, um, for since the 70s. I, I imagine when the first contest was played. Um, it's, a, it's a great – it's a great game, especially since I was the last class that graduated before Katrina hit. And then obviously the 06 and 07 classes graduated on the old campus. And then they obviously transitioned to another location. But what what makes that rivalry so special was the number of kids that went to Holy Cross also lived in the parish. They lived in Chalmette. Right. And so you had a, you know, in, in some ways you had Chalmette guys versus Chalmette guys uh, just in two different schools. So um, obviously with us moving to, you know, Paris Avenue and we don't, and we still have a ton of Chalmette people that live there, but we also have broadened our scope of students that we have that come from all different areas. Now, um, you know, keeping that tradition of the importance of that rivalry uh, is, is, is harder to do than what it used to be when I was playing, when it was just, you knew all 22 guys on their roster on offense and defense, and they knew all 22 guys on our roster on offense and defense. Um, but it's a tremendous rivalry. It's it's a great atmosphere. Um, I've been, you know, I've, I've been on one of the teams where it was the most uh, disheartening loss that we faced in my junior year. We lost 63 to 18 or I think or something like that. They went on to be a 10 and two team and went to semifinals. Um, and then I've been on the other side where we've, you know, we've been successful and we won those games against them. So what I do know is Chalmette has always been a team that's going to play with tremendous effort. 
Um, and they're going to punch you in the mouth. They play with a lot of pride. Chalmette people, if you're from Chalmette, you're proud to be from Chalmette. I don't know a single person that's from Chalmette that's not proud to be from Chalmette. <laughs> so these people that we're getting ready to go play, man, they, they take a lot of pride in their school, um, and rightfully so. So, you know, we, we it's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for both teams, 2-0, 2-0. Um, they beat two quality teams, um, you know, and, 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 and so have we, so, and it's going to be at their home stadium, man. And I, I'm, I'm expecting the parish to show out. Um, it's going to be a packed stadium in my opinion. Coach Watney, we appreciate you, uh, taking the time out to join us. Um, gotta, I want to ask you this right quick before we get in deep into this thing. Sure. Um, the name Watney is a powerful name. Do you have any relations with Don Watney <laughs> that used to coach at Ed the car? So every Watney's related. How closely related are we? We're not closely related. Um, but every Watney in, in, in this area, even if you spell your name with an E, uh, you know, I, we, I spell mine with N-Y and some people spell it N-E-Y. Somewhere along the lines, we're, we're kin folk to each other. But no, Don Watney uh, and I are not close relatives. But I tell you what, I'd have a lot of money if people paid me for every time I got asked that question because uh, I get asked it a lot. Um, but I do know that he, you know, he built a tremendous powerhouse and car uh, back when he was coaching. And so, uh, you know, uh, hopefully I can have the same similar legacy here at Holy Cross. Very good answer. Very good answer there. Um, you know, coming into this season, you inherited a team that has a lot of experience and everything else. Yeah. Do you think those experienced players, especially uh, with receivers Cross Johnson and also Long, and then your quarterback uh, as well, uh, Cole Canatella, who you know has been doing very, 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 very well, and also your defense, that experience. Do you think that kind of lightened your load a little bit when you got think, got started at Holy Cross this year? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know I think being a starter winning or losing or not experience is experience. Um, so I think that, um, I think that that's important, you know, and these guys obviously have been battle tested. Um, you know, you can't go through the Catholic league and not be battle tested, regardless of what your record is. You're facing the best of the best coaches and talent wise. Um, so yes, yeah, so, I mean, having those guys come back with, I guess that gap being real close in terms of winning um, and, and, is is a good thing but even though that gap's been real small that gap to close it is hard to close and so um that experience pays off but i've said this before and i'll say it again winning's infectious and so is losing and so we've been on the opposite side of this thing so you know experience will only take you so far it's the mindset of becoming a champion and becoming a, a winner and becoming a warrior and what that and what that looks like is is a challenge that all these guys are having to learn you know um i, I don't know that in the last i, I mean I, I somebody might correct me if this is a, a statement that's not right but i don't know last time holy cross has started out two and zero and a lot and, and a number of years you know so these guys are not used to winning they're more used to the other thing um so even that experience um still doesn't change the fact that these guys have you know we won seven games in the last three years where we're 33 and 59 in the last seven years um so experience does well with just being on the field but finishing games is obviously important and winning so uh i would say i don't know if it necessarily lightened the load um but it definitely helps in the scenario that i'm not playing with a bunch of guys that don't have experience you know you couple non-experienced players with not winning winning is going to be even that much more difficult so um but those guys that you mentioned, I mean, yeah, you know, obviously are tremendous players, and we got more than just the guys that you just mentioned that 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 really can help us win football games. Guys, two and zero on the season, you, you you defeated Holy Cross out of Houston, and then you took on down the South. You got your, you could say, aka the new word is getting your leg back. So you yeah. got payback last week, and it was a complete opposite of last season that yeah. Holy Cross had a big lead and Dallas South came back for the win, but you guys jumped on them this time, but you put them away. And yep. it, 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 how was, what was the feeling for you and for your players to, to finally just exercise a demon that kind of haunted Holy Cross the season? Yeah. I'll tell you what, one of their coaches actually 
I mean, this was an emotional game for all of us because, you know, we knew the 22 nothing lead that was squandered last year. Um, but one of their coaches in pregame said, we've been waiting all week for this. And then I, I actually stopped the warm-ups because I'm the one that leads the warm-up. And I said, they've been waiting one week. We've been waiting 365 days for this. Um, so we were getting ready to unleash hell on anybody who was going to be playing in that game that night. And, uh, I, you know, our guys, you can't – you can't experience winning without winning. And I know that sounds kind of weird to say, but our guys now are starting to understand that they can win and they can finish. And this game proved that. Um, I'm glad that it wasn't, we should have won the game in a, in a, in a much larger fashion than we did. Uh, we dropped two interceptions at, you know, one before halftime and one coming out of halftime. Um, and, and they get two scores off of it. You know, so if we catch the interception right before halftime, they go into halftime 21 nothing. We get the ball in the second half. We go down and we score. It's 28 nothing. They go on the ensuing drive. We miss another interception. If we catch that interception, we probably score down, go down and score again. It's 35 nothing, and it's not even uh, it, there's not even a, a, a chance of it getting within a one score game. So I'm glad those things didn't happen for us because those are great coachable moments for a team that's learning how to win. You know, um, those are things for us on still, hey guys, we did finish it. But if you really want to finish and you want to make a run in this district and you want to make a run in the playoffs, those missed opportunities of interceptions give really good quality teams more chances. The more chances you give them, the better chance they have of finishing on you, you know, and and, and finishing the game out. So I was extremely excited for our players. Um, but I could tell you, you know, come Monday when we had our team meeting, we still had 13 penalties for 135 yards and five of them were undisciplined penalties, stupid penalties. Um, you know, that will cost you a, a game, you know, and, 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 and so they probably didn't feel like they were two and zero on Monday. Cause I didn't feel two and zero. I was miserable for 48 minutes after watching some of the things that we did, but that's a good thing. And that's part of the growing process of, of, of a team learning how to win. And that's what we're doing. We're learning how to win, man. Um, but the best way to learn how to win is to win. And so those guys did that. So can't take away from the fact that we found a way to get it done where last year we did not Um, but I think it's because they believe. You know, I, I believe that their mindset is changing. I really believe that. Um, if they didn't, they could have easily just let the second half come and, and played a totally different 24 minutes, but they didn't. And uh, a credit goes to them. A credit goes to their coaches. A credit goes to the plan that we implemented that goes all the way back to when I first got hired in February. So there's a, a lot of things culminated into to a big victory like that, you know, that we had on Saturday night against a great team, man. You know, and I told those guys, in the at, at the end of the game and, and and even prior to the game, we want to be a De La Salle. You know, De La Salle the last seven years has been five times state runner ups. They've been semifinalists. Like we, we we've scratched seven wins in three years. So where those guys have been at, we want to get to. Um, you know, and 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 so we want to mimic what those guys have done. And so that was a big culture win for us. Um, a, a very huge cultural win that I think hopefully we'll 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 see success from. You know, later on in the season. From a win like that, looking at the uh, Shawmet uh, game coming up on Friday night, uh, yep. though, it's the atmosphere is going to be crazy and everything else. Holy Cross bringing a lot of fans with them. It's going to be a packed house more than yep. anything else. You know what would it mean to your team to get? I I know it's going to be a grinder yourself at your alma mater, Jason Tucker at his yep. alma mater, going against one another. What it would be like if you guys pull it off and hold the cross be three and up after Friday? It would be amazing. I mean, you know, like I said, we, we, we would tie the same amount of wins we had last year in three games. So that in itself would be um, that would be a big deal. But, you know, I, I will I will say this one thing that Holy Cross and even back when I played has always struggled with is we make opponents more than what they are. You know, so we, 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 we've we always done this, and it's something that I'm trying to rid of our culture and our program is, is that we're, we're playing a team, period. And how for us to beat a team is not necessarily what they do. It's what we do. Um, it's our execution of what our plan is. And if we do what we're supposed to do, then the score should take care of itself. That's that's the mindset. Doesn't matter who we're playing. Chalmette to Jesuit to Rommel to Shaw, you name a team. That's that's the mindset that I'm trying to get our guys to understand. Because I think when you overhype a team, what you tend to do is is you play outside of your level of comfort zone, and then you tend to press 
the accelerator too much. You, print, you, te- you, you tend to put more pressure than what it needs to be. It is a big game. It is a rivalry game. But nonetheless, it's a game. It's a week three opponent that we're trying to get better as a football program because our ultimate goal is to win a state championship. So we got another tw- – we got, we got another – my math serves me right. 13 weeks left, you know, this week plus the the next 12. So um, I, we're taking this one game at a time. This is a big game. You can't deny what a rivalry game is. Uh, but at the same time, we're trying to worry about what we do, not really about what other people are doing. Got to ask you this last thing before George Peppers will take over questions. Um, how does it feel for you to return to the Catholic League as a head coach? It's amazing. You know, I mean, it's it's <laughs> – it's special. You know, I mean, this is a, this is a coveted league, you know, it's, you know, you you just start thinking about the guys that have sat in the chairs that, you know, at not only at Holy Cross, but at other institutions in this league. And, you know, I like to refer to some of these guys as dinosaurs, man, they don't ever leave. And why don't they leave? Because it's such a coveted position, you know, who wants to leave out of the league that, you know, produces some of the best talent, you know, in the NFL produces some of the best coaches that go off to either have tremendous careers in the league uh, or go off to go do other things outside uh, and, and and create their own legacy. So um, I'm honored to obviously be here at home and at Holy Cross, um, but I'm also honored to be in a special league because this league is unlike anyone else and any other league. Um, and and it's just uh, it's an it's an incredible feeling. George Peppers. Coach Watney, first, I'm going to also thank you for taking the time for joining us. And it's a very busy week, obviously, with Chalmette, big rivalry game, and then having to go down there. I want to expound on the De La Salle game because for a little bit this year, you guys were up 21 zip at half. They got it to one score at 35-27. What was the thought process when they were making a run and then y'all were able to close it this time? Yeah, They got it to 35-27, yep. but your defense came up big late. What were you thinking when it got to 35-27, though? Um. There was no panic bu- uh, button for us. Um, I-, I will tell you, we actually had a uh, we we hired a guy to actually work on our mindset, um, and, it, and and the company's called Mindset. And one of the things he talked to us about on Thursday when we have our team meeting is, uh, or this week it was Friday because we played Saturday. Talked about a reset right. button, and I'm gonna tell you actually, uh, one of the young men that had an opportunity to uh, intercept the ball right before halftime. Uh, dropped it and wound up scoring and went in, we went in 21 seven was the score at halftime right. that same kid uh in the second half blocked an extra point um did an incredible job had a great get off blocked that blocked that extra point and we talked about hitting our reset button and, hey man bad things are gonna happen we got to hit our reset button we can't dwell on the past and I heard probably the majority of our team, when things got a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer to that one score game, it was reset, reset, reset. Just get back into your comfort zone and playing. Don't, don't, don't be in a panic situation. And again, that goes back to, you know, don't rise to the occasion. You know, you're going to fall to the level of your, you know, of your training. And we train our kids hard, man. If you ask, if you ask Kobe Young, he said today, he said, coach, we don't play on Friday. We play Monday and Tuesday. That's because that's how hard our practices are on Monday and Tuesday. And so, um, what was I thinking is even though it was a one score game, they still were chasing a point because of that, because of that one point difference of blocking that kick. It was the same kid that had an opportunity to intercept the pass, found a way to go make a big play for us. So there was really never a panic. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I have emphatic trust in our coaching staff and right before the, the, the touchdown, it really pulled it away. I mean, that was a third and I think a third and nine at the 33 yard line. Some, some are thinking about kicking a field goal. You're up by eight, make it a two score game. And my offense coordinator gets on a headset. He says, Scott, I got the play, man. What do you think? You want to go after it? And I'm like, absolutely. Let's go put the dagger in. If we don't show our kids that we have that faith in them to go do that, then they'll never have that faith at any point in time in the season. So um, we did, we executed Cole through a great corner route to Kobe and Kobe was standing in the back of the end zone with nobody around him. And then obviously, you know, we went up two scores and then we had the last uh, pick six for an interception. That was pretty much the game was out of reach at that point. No doubt. And very impressive effort by you guys that night, Saturday night. Um, 94 points. You're welcome. 94 points in two games, though. Your offense has really, really come on clicking. Uh, talk about team is going into Chalmette Friday night. You beat this team last year. They're going to be looking for revenge. You go to their house, Bobby Nuss. Um, where do you feel like your team's sitting? I mean, you're 2-0, but where do you feel – 
How do you uh, assess your team through two games? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're still a stupid football team. Because why? Because we make stupid penalties. <laughs> Wow. If you want to know my full assessment about my football team? Sure. That's what it is right now. You know, uh, personal fouls, unsportsmanlike penalties. I mean, you just you can't you can't win like that. And so uh, we paid the price on Monday for it. Um, and I and I'm hoping that our kids understand that I'm not playing around with them. I, I have no patience for that. You know, making a playing fast and playing hard. There's going to be inevitably times that things are, you know, you're going to have a call that goes against you that very well that you might have done. You might have had a golden call um, mm -hmm. you very well, you know, uh, might have a face mask. You know, those those things, those things happen when when you're playing really fast. Um, but but the things that can happen is, is the unsportsmanlike and the personal files, which we have had too many of those in the last two weeks. So how do I describe my football team? We're still a stupid football team that right now is 2-0, and that we're looking to become a smart football team and stop unnecessary things that are going to shoot us, shoot ourselves in the foot, and that's going to hurt us later down the road. Um, and Chalmette is a they, – they are a – a solid football team, man. This is, you know, and, and I would say the hardest challenge that I have this week is to humble my kids that 2-0 and is still 0-0, and and then that also do not get content and complacent with the fact that Chalmette is a team that we've beat pretty consistently over the last however many years. That goes out of, like, the, the, those thoughts cannot be in our, in our players' minds. So we're doing our best right now to remove those thoughts because this is a team that absolutely could beat our football team. There is no question without it. They 100% can. Um, and, and we're training our guys as if they're getting ready to come kick our ass because they are. That's what they're going to do come Friday. And they get you in their house on Friday night. Talk about the progression of Cole Canatella this year as compared to last. I know it's your first year at Holy Cross, but you've watched this kid play, and he's really come along and done great things. Uh, where is his got, ceiling? I, yeah, oh, oof. his ceiling is like his ceiling's through the roof, man. Because because of the progress that you're seeing. So you know, one of the earlier questions was, you know, what have you done? Um, you know, to kind of change the culture. And one of the first things I said was a coaching staff. Well, we went out and got the best coaching staff we could. What was the first place that I put emphasis on coaching staff was our offensive line play. Who do we go hire? Mark Sondry. Who's Mark Sondry? He's a Catholic league lifer. Yes, he is. At Brother Martin and at Jesuit, mm -hmm. won a state championship. He is an O-line guru. Who else did we go hire? We hired James Tabry, a Holy Cross alum who went on to go play at Arkansas State and McNeese State and had a stint in the NFL on the practice squad and was a starting quarterback. So we hired those two dudes along with the guy that's been on our staff, Coach Vance Andrea, as our offense coordinator. And that has freed Coach Andrea up to be a guy which is truly an offense coordinator where he doesn't have to watch every aspect of everything that's going on. He can be truly a play caller. And so you're seeing Cole's success because our offensive line's a lot better because he's got a real quarterback coach that literally every single snap is telling him what he's doing right and what he's doing wrong. And then you have Coach Andrew that's feeling no pressure other than in just being a great play caller and put our kids in, in situations to be successful. So Cole is definitely a byproduct of those things. And then also Cole and himself, he is – He's one of the hardest working guys on our team. He's one of the most humble guys that we have on our team. And he will literally run his face through another human person, uh, another human's chest if he has to. He will go grind it out with anybody. So he's easy to love. He's easy to feel comfortable when he walks out on the field because of what he does and then also what's been brought around him so that way he can shine. What's good? Last question before I turn it over back to Jared. Uh, Biggest key to get the win Friday night at Chalmette. What are you guys going to have to do to, to escape Poppy Nuts for the win? Yeah, so special teams has to play well again. Um, I thought that was a huge difference in the game against De La Salle with special teams. Um, we, we and I, and I feel that same way against um, against Chalmette. We're going to have to um, settle ourselves down off the adrenaline and play real football early because that emotion is going to be running high. It's going to be a hostile environment. We're going to have to remain calm, um, especially early on in the game and hit a rhythm early. And then really and truthfully, like I told you before, I mean, you ask what kind of team we have, we got to not be stupid. As, as long as we don't do anything that's self-inflicting, I feel great about our chances. If we continuously give Shalmet the opportunity to be successful because we're giving them the ball, because we're giving them – I mean, essentially we gave Dill South 13 free first downs. That's essentially what we did. Just take 13 of them. Um, if we do that to Shalmet, we can get our we, – we, we, we could be going back – 
to friggin' 5,500 Paris Avenue with a, with a loss. So um, I think the keys to success, special teams, settle in early and then not do any, not do anything to self-inflict ourselves, you know, for, for, for lack of success. We would like to thank everyone who is tuning into this show tonight. Thank y'all so much. Also click that subscribe button and share it with everyone else that, you know, coach Watney, we will get you out of here with this last question. Yeah. As you know, as of last year, around week two, the LHSAA changed their playoff format. Yep. This year, nine schools sued the LHSAA, and the judge were, was in favor of those nine schools. And supposedly we're back to the format that we had in 2021. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that? Are you in favor of it? You don't care? You just play anybody? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I have I have my competitor attitude, which is this, whoever it is. I don't care. It goes above my pay grade to even try to figure these things out. So I got enough issues that I got to deal with on a daily basis. Trying to figure out what's going to be, when it's going to be, is kind of irrelevant to me. Um, What am I in favor of? In my personal opinion, I am in favor of a combination of how it used to be, simply because I thought that that is the best for our kids, period. Um, I know that there's pros to one side and there's pros to the other and there's cons to one and there's cons to the other. But I think generally speaking, the best that the state experienced was when you had to go through 32 real football teams in order to win a state championship. And look, I, I just got an email from, uh, as an assistant coach in 2013, I was a part of the 14 and 0 state championship team at Vermilion Catholic. I was an assistant coach there. It was by far an unbelievable experience. But if you were to ask even those players on that team, they wanted nothing more than to play Mangum that year, who also won, who was the 1A on the non-select side because they wanted an opportunity to face the best. And so they were the best on their side, but there was another best on the other side. Who really is the best in this current model? In my opinion, I don't think you can answer that question, honestly. I think that's what's disappointing is, is that, you know, it's kind of like the Roger Maris, the, the asterisk. You know, it's like, gosh, dog, man, like, can we just play and then just figure it out? So I personally was in favor of last year's just simply because I thought it gave more substance to the playoffs. Um, it wasn't an all or nothing deal, which I don't think is ever going to happen. Um, but I think we're I think returning to the way that it was in 2021 in our league, it's essentially playing the same teams over. And that's right. it, to me, that's incredibly unfair to our district. It's incredibly unfair to have to play Jesuit twice, to have to play Brother Martin twice. It's hard enough to beat them one time. And if you don't believe that, then you just you could just join our league for two years and then you can get out and go somewhere else if that's how you feel about it. But it's incredibly hard to do that again um, when you play such a I mean, it's 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 just a crappy playoff system in that in that way. But it is what it is. If that's what happens, that's what happens. And we'll play who we have to. Coach Scott Watney of the Holy Cross Tigers football team. We thank you for joining us. Good luck this Friday night against Sean Matt and good luck throughout the rest of the season. Thank you all. I appreciate this. It's been great, guys. Y'all have a good night. You too, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Coach Scott Watney of the Holy Cross Tigers. Big game against Chalmette. Look, I said it earlier. Chalmette will have to contain their wide receivers. And that's a, that's a, that's a tall task. I think Cross Johnson and Colby Young will have a good game. They have a good game and still be held scoreless. It can happen. But it's a tough task for Chalmette to cover those guys. And those two wide receivers are just phenomenal. Um, VK, your thoughts on the Holy Cross Tigers right now? Because as you see, Scott Watney is changing the culture that was there in the past. And he's got these guys off to a 2-0 start. So he's doing something right. Yes, he is doing something right. And you look, and I wanted to ask him this, but it's okay. Um, so oh, you didn't put the finger up. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to put the signal, but that's okay. It's all right. <laughs> I know Coach Whitney is still probably watching. But Scott Whitney is a graduate of Holy Cross in 2005. So this was before Katrina. So he was at the old Holy Cross in the Ninth yeah. Ward before the new Holy Cross came through. So it's a lot of change. And at, at that time, Barry Wilson was the head coach at Holy Cross. So for him to come from 
a winning tradition and not just a winning tradition from what Holy Cross went through at that time before and to now for him to try to change a culture. He's doing some good things and he's really the biggest challenge at Holy Cross is to change a culture, but not just that to turn Holy Cross to relevancy, to turn Holy Cross to consistency. That's the two biggest things he's trying to do. And I like what he's doing so far. And it's going to be a big test this week. And the thing you're, you're talking about right now, we've been looking at some trends over the last four to five years. We go from DBs to running backs to office alignment to defense alignment. What's the trend this season? Wide receivers. We got a whole bunch of wide receivers all over the place. You thought last year, last year was one of the deepest running back cores we have ever seen in the state of Louisiana the last year. This year, this is probably the most deepest we've ever seen in the state of wide receivers. You name it, you can name any team in the city or the state of Louisiana, you find a good receiving core, and it is a good one at Holy Cross with Cross Johnson and also Kobe Young, who is the brother of Kalaja Linscombe, a state champion at formerly from Jesuit. So I tell you, you got a lot of speed, got a lot of offense. This Holy Cross team looks pretty good, but they got a tough test Friday night in the parish. GP. I don't think there's any question that VK is right about the fact that Holy Cross has a really tough spot Friday. But, again, I pointed this out when we talked about this game from the Chalmette side of things. Their DBs are going to be in for a heck of a challenge. The thing is, Holy Cross has scheduled after this week. They go into district next week. They get Rummel. Good catchback because guess what? Rumble's playing the megaphone game Friday at Zimmerman against Shaw. So they could be catching them on the, on either the downtrend or the uptrend. And then they just go straight through district. Do you know that their last non-district game is in week 10 on a Thursday night against East St. John? So nothing comes easy. They get the Catholic League in East St. John to close after Chalmette Friday. They got so, a big win on East St. John last year. That was a shocker. Yeah, they did. Um, but East St. John looks pretty formidable this year, at least early. Uh, they look they look improved. They look really on point early. You know, with the of course the dramatic win against St. James and then the the massacre over Carver last week. But Holy Cross, they've been impressive offensively. I you know I can't help but think Coach Watney said what was what my one of my friends told me the same thing that Holy Cross, you know, made a lot of mental mistakes in that game, penalties and of the like. That can't happen if you continue to win. The opposition gets better. Not that De La Salle is a bad team. That's a good football team they beat. And I don't know much about the Holy Cross team they beat out of Texas, you know, in week one, but they beat them 45 nothing. So they did something right there. Um, but then now they get into Catholic League play, that mental, you know, mistakes that Coach Watney talked about, that's not going to win a game in the Catholic League if you go in those with those games against Rumble, All, Curtis, Carr, Brother Martin, Jesuit. That's a six-pack of toughness right there. And then you get East St. John. Holy Cross is going to maintain this. They're going to have to continue to elevate offensively and clean up the penalties. But as far as Friday night, it's an airtight game, VK. I think this is a coin flip, 50-50. Absolutely. This is a evenly matched ball game. Last year, we thought it was a – it was pretty much a good first half in ball game. Holy Cross made a lot of adjustments and got yep. the job done in the second half. But I think this is going to come – this is a definitely going to be a four-quarter game coming down to the wild one or a few times in this rivalry that we've seen a tight game. This is going to be a good one, and it's probably going to come down to a field goal with these two teams. So it's going to be a good one. It would be a very cool scenario if Holy Cross has a winning record, finish between one to three in the Cat League, and plays East St. John for a possible high seed. That could be an interesting scenario because you think about East St. John, that's two tremendous wins, and it helps their power rankings. So just a little something to think about, but we're too early in the season, but that's some sort of a cool scenario if things go right for the Holy Cross Tigers. Mm -hmm. Number one, they are my surprise team in the Catholic League, Holy Cross. That's my surprise team. If there's a team you got to pick that could win it, it's this team here. I think they're going to be 
a great challenge for anyone. Number two, Rene Cray. He says that the Crescent City Sports game of the week is East Ascension and Destrahan. They are yeah, covering yeah, that game. Yeah, it still is. It still and is. number three, Kenny Ramonde. Where are we at this week? Well, after this commercial, I'll tell you where we'll be at this week. So we're going to take this quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Right here on the Hash It Out Show. And we are back on the Hazard Out Show. That is Bayou Audio and Video. You can find them in Marrero, Louisiana. Um, Kenny Ramonde, to answer your question, the game of the week, the Hazard Out Show game of the week, will be between the St. Charles Catholic Comets and the Turlings Catholic Rebels from Lafayette, Louisiana. So we got a good ball game between the two-time defending champions, St. Charles Catholic, and last year's semifinalists in Division II select the Turlings Catholic. So we will be in Laplace. Well, VK Jones and George Peppers will be in Laplace calling the game this upcoming Friday night. Now, guys, if you guys haven't heard, Todd Garvin, the head coach at West Monroe, was fired today. He was fired. For those of you who, do, who does not know why he was fired or what is going on, I'm going to tell you. So, since Ty Garvin took over as the head coach of West Monroe, he has had four heat-related illnesses amongst his players. Four. The last one, the last one, missed football practice for a whole week because he had COVID. When he comes back, he has to do something called makeup work. Kid gets rushed to the hospital for his heat related illness. That's too many on the one person's watch. Now, Coach Garvin came out and said he takes full responsibility for what happened to those four kids. You have no choice to, they're under your watch. The safety of these players are under your watch. The parents are putting their trust in you. There are new rules that you have to abide by when it um, due to the LHSAA. 96 degrees and higher, you cannot practice. So, what was it that he was doing wrong? What if he was what if he was practicing in 96 and below? What if he was? See, not letting kids hydrate, rehydrate, get water. I don't get it. I don't get it. It's very odd to me. But yes, I think West Monroe did the right thing by getting rid of Todd Garvin. And in an interview on the morning drive with Aaron Dietrich, Aaron Dietrich asked him, is there anything you would like to say? And you know what he said? He never had the backing of the administration at West Monroe. And then he says to the head coaches out there, watch who you hire. Watch who you hire, especially those you put in big positions. They may stab you in the back. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not able to speak on the backing or not having the backing from the administration because I don't know. But I would think he had the backing. He's a West Monroe alum. I would think he had that backing. But when he said, watch who you hired, especially in big positions, they may stab you in the back. Is he trying to say that someone on the coaching staff got him fired? Is that what he's saying? If you take full responsibility for four kids, being rushed to the hospital for heat-related illnesses. 
How in the hell can you sit there and say, why should you hide? I might stab you in the back. What if it's a coach that cares about these kids and sat there and said, hey, he ain't letting them get water, this and that. Something got to be done. What if there's an assistant coach that stepped up for those kids because he cared? And I asked that in question form, as you see, because I don't know all the details. But man, you take responsibility, but then you say that? I don't know about that. GP. You and I talked about this earlier today when we did our sound check for, in advance of the show tonight. Um, I'm going to say a couple of things about Todd Garvin, the person. For him to come out and say that about his staff, that tells me one thing. He's a coward because he's not taking forward. He's, he's, he's talking out of two sides of his mouth. Hold on First one, of all. Hold on one second, George Peppers. Um, my good friend Jordan Taylor from Under the Lights. And you can catch Under the Lights. 8.30 tomorrow, and you catch them Friday at midnight, maybe 1 o'clock. They do their, their show. Um, so under the lights on Facebook, you can catch them. Um, but Jordan says he's already been hired to coach the tight ends at Ruston. Wow. Wow. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Okay. Now, hypocrite and coward are the two words I'm going to use to describe Todd Garvin. Hypocrite because on Aaron Dietrich's show, The Morning Drive, he said he takes full responsibility, but in the same breath, he turns around and says, watch who you uh, talk to. My boy, uh, coach, get your mind right, first of all, because what you did was inexcusable. First of all, I get we had an unprecedented summer heat wave. We did. This, heat, this summer heat was ridiculous. When there were consecutive days of indices in the 115s, and that will wear into on anybody. And hence why I when when we did our pre you know preseason shows, we I, I made it a point to ask every coach that we had about practice habits. What did they do to accommodate the heat to accommodate themselves to the heat? And every coach had a different answer. Most were uniform and saying they were obviously looking out for the kids' welfare. But Todd Garvin gets hired at West Monroe. And four kids get uh, heat, heat, heat strokes or heat uh, illnesses or whatnot. One of them you mentioned had COVID, right? Makeup work? Come on. Why? Are you serious? First of all, I don't know if y'all two have caught COVID. I did. I did. Uh, I did. I caught it. We can't. Did you? Yes. Okay. So the three of us have had it. We know it's five to seven days quarantine. Your body has to recuperate. It doesn't, it's not in full strength. Even when you clear, you know, you're, you know, obviously the, the, the symptomatic stuff goes away, but you're not in full strength. So this young man was made to come back and practice in desert heat and bam, he goes to the hospital. West Monroe, I don't applaud you for a lot of things because I've seen uh, some of the stuff you've done. I respect what you've done winning. But there's some other things that you've done that I'm kind of against. And this is where the familiarity comes in because I lived in their district. You know, they played in the, in the same district as Alexandria, who was close to where I lived. Um, so I know a little bit about them. And hey, heck, we all know about some of the championships they won. But West Monroe, in this case, you're 100% right to fire the man. Now... What happens going forward now? Garvin's at at Ruston coaching tight ends. What amazes me, BK, and I'll flip this to you, is that man has actually got an, uh, got another job. I get we're a second chance country. I believe in second chances one hundred percent. But this dude should not see a sideline for the 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 idiocy that he pulled at West Monroe. You know, practicing the way that he did. You know. There's got to be autonomy, true autonomy taken at West Monroe saying, you know what, we'll take it. Good, good night, see ya. Now, I don't know if they fired him with cause. I just know they fired him. With cause means they don't have to pay him. Um, but VK, I, I just feel like he shouldn't be coaching, but that's just me. I, I agree with you. I think he should not be coaching at all. I think he must have connections with the head coach or a couple administration up at Ruston. So that's why he's probably got the job up at Ruston. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I but I definitely agree he should not be coaching anywhere this year. If he gets picked up as an assistant, pick him up next season. Don't don't let him coach this year. He need to get his head right. 
more than anything else. This is, you know, it's it's crazy. You know, West Road got a little desperate trying to find their coach and everything. It, it's it, it's karma just coming back to roost for West Monroe. It's karma coming back to roost. Yeah, the winning was there. But then there was other things in the past that, did, that they've done. And now it's coming back to bite them in the butt. It's been a long time coming. And now they're getting, they are getting the karma right now, regardless of the fact. I think, yeah, what, uh, what, what Todd Garvin did was unprecedented. And the firing, yes, it should have happened. Applaud, I applaud you, West Monroe, for making the move. For him to get on and Rustin, you know, I don't like it, but I don't knock it because the fact of the matter is he must have connections. And a lot of coaches always have some kind of connection somewhere, and they get on quick. So that's how it goes in this state. That's how it goes anywhere. But at the same time, it's just karma. To, it's biting West Monroe right now. That's what it is. I, I, I got to go back to the interview he had. He also said there are still a lot of old school coaches out there. When someone misses practice, they make them do makeup work. Okay, so I understand if a kid missed practice and didn't tell you they had a doctor appointment or whatever, or if they did, I, I, I get it. I get it. Trust me, I do. I've been there, done that. But we talk about somebody who had COVID. Just got over COVID. That's the part I'm, I, I just don't understand. Like, they just got over COVID, man. Where's your sympathy at? Like, literally, you're punishing a child because they had COVID. Oh, you missed the whole week of practice because you had COVID? Okay, make up work. That 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 just shows he got no consideration. He didn't care. At all, period. He didn't care. It, it, it's it, just it, four it, kids. It, four it, kids it, to the it, hospital it, for heat-related issues. He I, didn't care. I hate to say it for Ty Garvin. I really question his humanity. Big time. Because I understand certain stuff, but dude, the dude came from he is recovering from a from from a devastating more than devastating flu life symptoms kind of thing now when you could not not just with covid is more devastating than the flu but when you come off the flu or if you get your wisdom teeth taken out it's it takes some time to recover you have to show consideration of that when you try to give him make up work in the heat and he just that's sick that just shows how sick of a person you are and on the other side of things to me you need to go get help you psychologically you need to go get help because that that that's not good that's not good at all and and i'm telling you these this generation of kids are gonna check out and they check out quicker than they ever been because okay. if they don't see it their way or you ain't going to try to help them. Like, man, forget this. I don't care about this. Damn that. They go in the other direction. They ain't going to do right. They ain't, And they ain't going to even care. So guess what? Ty Garvin needs serious help. And I'm still on this part because think about it. What if that kid was around the whole football team and the coaching staff and they all caught COVID? What did that happen? Mm. Yeah. Oh, got COVID? Oh, stay where you're at. Stay at home. Get well. Come back to practice when you're symptom-free. Yeah, 100% clear. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because, listen, let's go to the West Run Road timeline with Jerry Arlings when they fired him. You you know, I, I read a lot of blog sites and everything else. West Run Road's alumni were absolutely looking to savage Arlings. They've been wanting to get rid of him. They finally got their comeuppance and got rid of them last after last season. Uh, I think Acadiana put them out of the playoffs last year, if I remember right. Um, anywho. No, Zachary. Okay. Zachary. Zachary. That's right. Yeah, Zachary popped them. So, anywho, they whacked Jerry Orleans because they said, man, we ain't been to the Dome in a minute. You know, we haven't been to the Superdome in a while. So, they figure, well, let's 
good riddance, Jerry. All let's just get Garvin, our alumnus. And I think they thought it was peaches and cream. BK mentions the word karma. Last I checked, karma's never lost. Undefeated, undisputed champion of everything. And they're getting what's coming to them. Y'all want to sit there and act all bigoty, talk about the University of West Monroe. Man, cut that noise out. You're a high school. There are people actually saying that stuff on block sites. It's like, man, slow your roll there, high school. Yeah, oh, yeah. There were commenters, you know, people just flapping their gums, you know, keyboard warriors. They had, I think they beat Rumble, right? I, right? I, actually, actually, they been said that even before then. Even even Ed Daniels gave him that much respect and said that on air doing. But, he said he said that to Evangel and to West Monroe because of the but fact that's, that when the when that's when they were that's winning. That's when they were winning. That's when they were winning. That's what I'm saying. saying. Yeah, what have they won lately? They haven't won nothing <laughs> lately. That's what I'm, I'm saying. But they've been had that name though. That's what I'm saying. They've been okay, had that, 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 they ain't winning. <laughs> exactly. What does that mean when you're goose wow. egging? Evangel was an old for team two years ago. Is they that were that I'm okay with it. I mean, well, that's different. That's all about the Z, right? That's what they, they say, say now. That's what they say. That's right. Yeah, exactly. That's their catch line. But that being said, look, to put a postmortem on this, it's over and done. I'm just surprised that somebody actually employed this man. I'm not going to go as far as VK saying about him being mentally, I mean, you know, whatever. I think the fact that he said there's old school coaches, I want to ask Coach Garvin one thing. Define old school coach for me in your terms. That's the only question I want to ask him. What is an old school coach by your definition? And I mean, I'd be very interested to hear this answer because I guarantee you, I guarantee you, some of the old school coaches we have here, Bryce Brown, Jerry, Jerry Phillips, JT Curtis, you. Uh, Hank, do you think they would do what Garvin did? Hell no. I know we all know Hank and all these guys that I just mentioned. We all know them personally. Uh, Marcus Scott, Frank Daggs, Linares, Elpage, Elpage. Coaches, they're a little bit younger. But do you think they would do what Garvin did? Hell no. No. There's a bit of a chance of a herd of cows outrunning, outrunning a track team than them doing something like that. I mean, that's just foolishness to think that. So what the hell? That's the question I would ask Todd Garvin, guys. What is an old school coach in your definition? I don't want to hear coach speak. I want you to tell me what the hell you mean. What do you mean by that? Because I know what he means, but I want to see if he has the guts and the temerity to say it. I don't think he does. I say he's a coward, and and I stand by what I say. If that gets me controversial, but blowback, fine. But I think Todd Garvin is a coward because he got fired. And he didn't even, I don't think he's true to apologizing to the parents of the kids he put in the hospital because it was under his auspices that those kids went to the hospital under his watch. Where's the apology? Or better yet, pay their hospital bill. All How right. about that? <laughs> All right, we're going to move on. The game of the week, the Hash It Out Show game of the week. I'm sorry, excuse me. The Hash It Out Show game of the week is the St. Charles Cali Comments against the. Turlings Catholic Rebels. You two guys are calling it. BK, you go first. What are your thoughts about this game coming up? It's going to be a great matchup this week, man. It's uh, probably one of the best ones we're going to do this year. Um, Turlings Catholic, a, a very good team coached by Dane Chapache, a very familiar name in itself. That's actually the son of Sonny Chapache, who has done an unbelievable job at Turlings Catholic. And for him to continue the tradition – and the winning over there, they have really done some great things and having a good start once again this season and probably one of the toughest districts in the state of Louisiana as they're going on the road against the two-time state champs. It's going to be an interesting matchup, especially with Coach Wayne Stein looking to try to go 3-0 and on the season and not just that, continuing a big winning streak for St. Charles Catholic. So, you know, it, it's going to be a really good matchup, good coaching matchup. And this game could really go down to the wire. We're expecting a very big crowd on Friday at Thomas Duque Stadium. First time ever that we will be. I, I've been in St. Charles Catholic before, but I have not been inside the stadium. So it will be really great to be there. And I tell you, I'm looking forward to what's going to happen on Friday night. GP. I'll be on the call with VK on this game Friday night. Um, 
I expected an airtight affair. St. Charles' mm -hmm. defense is legit. There should be no question. They have been absolutely – I thought they were in trouble last week at Lutcher when they were behind because, you know, they struggled at Shaw and their defense bailed them out. Same thing happened at Lutcher in a very tough road environment. This is a seasoned, battle-tested, two-time reigning, defending state champion in Division Three. This is going to be the test, though, because Turley's Catholic plays Temple offense. They, they fly on the offensive side of the ball. They can go. And this is going to be a very unique and interesting challenge to St. Charles. I think we're in for a really good football game. And I'm like, VK, that's, that's the stadium, at least on the St. Charles side, is going to be airtight. It's going to be packed. I think they're going to roll them in. Turlings, I know, travels well to road games. And I think they're going to bring a flock of people down, too. It is a pretty arduous trip from Lafayette to, to Laplace. But you're not going to school on Saturday. You know, so make the trip down and go support your team. I say that about a, a, some of the local schools here. You know, you don't support your team enough. I'll save that for week five. I'll just save that for week five. All right, because that's going to be our, our, that, the next, and that's going to be whenever you, uh, I won't. I mean, if you go on our site, you can see what game we have on week five, but I'm going to let it fly then. I'm not saving, I'm not going to do it tonight. I'm going to be nice. I'm gonna the angel pepper, angel George peppers is gonna be nice, but the horns are coming if I if I don't hear anything new by week five. Um, but we're in for a good game Friday night. I'm looking forward to the call with VK and Jared. You're gonna be at Shaw to to watch the megaphone game, and we just want to make sure if we don't need a, a psychiatrist on call if Rumble wins again. You good? I'll be fine. I promise. You. I'm just making sure because I my my color analyst Friday night is already at, he's chomping at the bit. Don't, and he's already told me if Rumble yeah, beats Shaw, <laughs> he's already said it to me. If Rumble busts Shaw, look out, he's gonna talk. And I, I don't have duct tape or, or a muzzle, so I don't know what to tell you. So you if, the abuse you. may come, Zachary, St. August, Zachary. All right, it guys, look, I want to get to the last topic. I know we had a lot to talk about. We'll get to the Saints and LSU tomorrow, but we, we press for time right now. Mm -hmm. I want to get to this one right quick. Just, um, Give your thoughts on, about it. Warren Easton versus Edna Carr. Warren Easton, of course, as you know, cannot participate in the playoffs. They have gone up to Russ. This is their Super Bowl. This is their state championship. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay. All right. This is the state championship. Warren Easton has lost the last 11 times to Edna Carr since 2016. They are ready to prove to everyone that they can beat Edna Carr and that the seniors on Well, what's the question you asked? I know I, I kind of remember. Well, my thoughts on it, I think I really think this is, like I said before, and I'm going to say it again, this is um, Warren Easton's best chance to be at the car. This is their best chance. And I overheard somebody saying, like, at the car is good, but at the same time, at the car did not really beat anybody. Warren East has beat the two, has took on the two best teams in the state, and has beaten, beaten both of them, and won them very, very handily. So this should be a very interesting game. I think this game can go down to the wire again, or not just that. If Warren Easton has control, maybe they pull away. But at the same time, is I think this is going to be a great ball game once again. This Friday night, this week is just – it's a hell of a week of games, man. I mean, out of all the games this season, week three is is definitely the place to be this week. But I really think this is going to be interesting. Going into tag on me this time, this game is on a, on, on a, your view this time, mm -hmm. on a big screen so people can see, you know. But it's going to be interesting. Call's going to be ready to play. East is going to be ready to play. 
regardless of this being 11 straight games that Carr has won, at least six out of those 11 games have been close. Yeah. And this is going to be another good one coming up on Friday night. This is going to be another classic between these two great teams. And I could tell you, I, I, we'll, we'll make the pick tomorrow. But I'm like this, and I'm going to still stick to it. This is Warren Easton's biggest chance because I'm telling you now, Warren Easton doesn't be in the car this season. I don't know when they're going to beat him. Might be never, VK. I mean, that sounds a little facetious and sarcastic, but Warren Easton's had teams that were capable of beating Carr, just couldn't get the job done. Now, granted, I grant you, there were a couple of those games where Carr just destroyed them because they were that much better. But that Warren Easton was taking steps in those in those games and they got blown out. You know, the 66 to 13 game they played uh, one year, uh, Carr was just miles better in every facet. Warren Easton is now caught up. It's the thing. It's the old axiom. You ever see a NASCAR race where a car is fast to get to the lead, but when he tries to clear and he can't, or even better, since I'm the horse racing guru, if your horse is coming up next to the leader looking like he's going to blow by him, and oops, he hits the cinder block inside the last 100 yards, and he loses. That's Warren Easton right now. They've got to find a way to clear the hurdle. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised Jerry Phillips might be bringing in a couple of key people from that. They, they might be bringing a couple of key people from the last time. Warren Easton uh, beating that in the car. I wouldn't be surprised he might bring in Deshaun Caper Smith or Tyron Johnson up in there to talk to the team and give them some inspiration on how they got it done that particular night up at Pan American Stadium the last time that they defeat, defeated that in the car. And it, mm -hmm. was, and it was a close game, but then all of a sudden Warren Easton turned it up and yep. was one-sided as I don't know what. And you know when they and I call I remember I called that game for Chris City Sports, and it was crazy how they scored the touch uh, the equalizing touchdown with like two minutes left to go up more than two scores, and all I thought about was the fact that that is over ten years of suffering and for them to just execute revenge. So that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Who knows what we'll see on Friday, but. Expect we'll make the pick for that game tomorrow night. Yeah, exactly. Expect and an absolute war Friday night. It will be. I mean, that could have been a game. If your view wouldn't have had that game, we would probably would have took that game. But, uh, VK, any final thoughts before we go off? Oh, man. Oh, man. This is a great night tonight. And, and it was great. Always. To, um, it was great to have, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Jason Tucker, the head coach of the Shalman Owls. And also the head coach of the Holy Cross Tigers, Scott Watney. This has been a really good night tonight, you know, discussing mm -hmm. high school football. Tomorrow we'll have our picks. We'll tell you who came out on top with our picks from last week. And mm -hmm. also we'll have a we have a guest tomorrow night. Jay Rose. We will, yep. We will have the former uh, the legend. Former head coach, the legend, Jay yes. Rose. Athletic director of the Archbishop Roman Raiders talking about the story of the megaphone game, how that got going, and how it became a big time rivalry over the years. So, we're think, looking forward to have uh J Raw tomorrow night to the show, okay. and then we'll also talk LSU, Tulane, and stuff like that, preparing everybody for, for another week football number, weekend, another football weekend, week three for the prep, week three for college football. Week two of the NFL. The NFL. Oh, can you hear me? Like, we can yeah, hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear right. you. Right. I, don't see you on the, I don't see you on the screen. Yeah. Man. I don't. I don't have a camera. I don't. I don't know why. Hold on. Let me see. Oh wow. Oh. There we go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'm sorry, everybody. He's back. Technical difficulty on my end. Just internet. I guess went down for a second. Y'all two went away. I was like, what the hell happened here? But uh, I know we can, it keeps we can, going. We keeps going, keeps going. So we all good. But thank y'all. No, well, no doubt about it. But look, for I guess uh, I guess I take the lead in signing us off tonight. But you on can. that note, uh, 
Uh, we want to thank Scott Watney and Jason Sucker for spotlighting the Holy Cross Chalmette game Friday, this coming Friday, one of the oldest rivalries. We thank them for joining us tonight. Tomorrow night, we will have Jay Roth, the legendary former head coach of the Archbishop Rumble Raiders. He's going to join us to talk about Shaw Rumble Friday night. And there's a humorous question I'm going to ask him. I think I told Jared this earlier, or VK, one of y'all. I, I didn't tell both of y'all, but I told one of y'all. But I'm not going to say it over the air. I'm going to wait till tomorrow night. Uh, and it isn't. It is pertaining to Friday, obviously. This question is, but we ha- we will make our picks for week three. I can tell you that Jared and I had twenty three, and we were twenty three and six last week. VK was twenty two and seven. Look, we bounced back from a subpar week one, and we rolled week two. So we're looking to keep that roll going, and of course we're going to talk LSU, Tulane, Saints, uh, and whatnot. Who knows? Maybe a little Dion, two and zero, oh, Colorado, but. For Jared J.B. Boyd, for V.K. Jones, I'm George Pappas. Good night. We will talk to you again tomorrow night, 8 o'clock, here on the Hash It Out Show. Have a good night and stay safe. Y'all take care. Yep. The Hash It Out Show is brought to you by Barreto Home Solutions. Bayou Audio and Video. Hot Works on the North Shore. JFK Martial Arts in Mandeville and Covington. Blackhawk Hauling. Lil Dizzy's Cafe. Wags Food and Culture. Moe's Pizza. The Green Law Firm. Personal Injury Attorney. Drums Earwear. Thank you for watching the Hash It Out Show.